As human beings, we were created to worship. Uh -huh. But God is very clear about who we should worship. We, we were created. There's something uh, inherent, innate in us that lets us know that there is something greater that lives outside of us that makes us desire to worship. God created us that way. But he is very clear about who we are supposed to worship. The very first commandment that God gave to Moses and the people of Israel on Mount Sinai was, you shall have no other gods before me. It's not just one of the Ten Commandments. It is the very first commandment. Here God claims ownership. He says, I am the Lord your God. He claims ownership. I am your God who brought you out of Egypt. God says, I claim ownership. I brought you out of bondage. I brought you out of Egypt. God says, I take credit for whatever I brought you out of. It was not your mother, it's not your father, it's not your boss, not your girlfriend, not your boyfriend, not your hookup, not your homie. I am the Lord your God and I brought you out of Egypt. You gotta respect me. I'm the one who broke the shackles off of your neck. I'm the one that brought you out of bondage. I'm the one that brought you out of slavery. And so God says, therefore, based on the fact that I am really the one who did a great thing in your life, you shall have no other gods before me. No other God. No other God, better translated, no other God beside me. In fact, in fact, in the Bible it talks about how they had taken, the Philistines had taken uh, Dagon, who was a false god, and put him in the same room as the Ark of the Covenant, which was a symbolic of the presence of God. And when they woke up in the morning, they found that false god laying flat on his face with his head and his feet chopped off, chopped off because God said, I won't have it. I will have no other God before me. There is nobody else up here but me. Now I looked beside me and there was no other God. There are those who claim to be gods, but they are false. They are liars because I am the only one. I am, I am the only one who had, who exhibited, who loved you enough to set you free from whatever was bounding you. I am. Somebody say, I am. I claim ownership. And because I'm the one who sets you free, I want to be respected in that way. And anything you put up in front of me as a God, I'll slap it down. Anything you put up before me and claim that this thing, this person, this job delivered me, I'll slap it down. I'll slap it right on his face. I'll cut his feet off. I'll cut his head off. I'll show you who's boss because I'm God. The apostles understood, were so aware of people's tendency to worship, to worship people and make gods out of people, that they remind them in one place, because the Lord was using the apostles so strongly and the power of God was on them, people were tempted to worship them. We're into hero worship. Every time somebody does something extraordinary, we are into hero worship. But every time they wanted to bow down to the apostles, he said, no, 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 don't, don't worship us. We are men of like passions, just like you. Right. We put our pants on the same way you do one leg at a time. Right. We have a tendency to want to fall into hero worship. You follow what I'm saying? We should admire. We can admire people. We can respect people. The Bible said to give honor to whom honor is due. But where we cross the line is where we begin to idolize people. More specifically, where we begin to obey men rather than obey God. So idol worship was something that God spoke strongly against, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. So let's, so let's just back up a little bit and digress and talk about what is idol worship. So you can get something out of this lesson. Are you ready? In simple terms, an idol is anything that takes the place of God in a person's life. So idolatry is simply anything or anybody that we deem more important or more valuable to us than God himself. Over and over, we see where God would judge whole nations and even punish Israelite kings, kings that he would set up. If they fell into idol worship, God says, I'm jealous. Anytime you put something up, erect something in front of me and say that this is God, you're going to get on my nerves. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, God even rebukes Israel for the foolishness of idol worship. Here's what he says. You go out there and you cut down a tree. And you overlay it with gold and you put part of the wood in the fire and burn it and you set it up in a temple and then you call the thing that you created with your own hands your God. Isn't that something that how foolish is it that you would go out to the forest and put the labor into cutting down a tree 
and you would go through all the effort of overlaying it with gold. And then you would set it up in a temple and pray to a thing that has no eyes and no hands and expect to be a, a worshiper of it. Sounds crazy, don't it? Sounds really foolish, doesn't it? But yet we do it all the time. We place all sorts of things in the place of God in our lives. We place culture, race, political affiliations, social status, denominations, even, even family traditions. Some of us are guilty of putting those things in the place of God. That when it comes down to your faith or your politics, that you often choose your politics over your faith. That when it comes down to your race or your God, that you often put your race as more important than your God. All these things, your family traditions, our tradition is that we go to grandma's house on Sunday, so we can't go to church on Sunday because we go to grandma's house every third Wednesday, every third Tuesday, every third Sunday, whatever your tradition is. And it's amazing how we'll even put family traditions in the place of God. And so God says, I'm jealous. You have all these things that you have set up, systems, denominations, creeds, cultures, that you bow to on a daily basis instead of me. So let's dig in here just a little bit, okay? Can we go for me? In our text, there was some who had uh, accused Paul of simply being an opportunist. There was some in in the Corinthian church, which he wrote here. Uh, but they, they said that Paul was simply an opportunist. They called him, according to them, call, called him walking according to the flesh, right? They accused him of being self-willed, self-interested, uh, being insincere. They accused Paul of being a con artist who wrote great letters, but in person he'd be more timid, basically saying that his bark was worse than his bite. Right. They wrote all these great letters telling people what to do and straightening churches out and all that. But in person, he was somebody they thought he, he, he couldn't back up his words. You know how people do. You're talking big on Facebook, talking big on Instagram, talking big through a text. But in person, you'd be really timid that you couldn't even back up what you were saying. And so because of Paul's energy and because of the drive, because of the passion he had to see the churches grow, they accused him of being somebody who was only doing it to serve his own selfish ambitions, that it wasn't about people, that was really about him. That as he started these churches, he was trying to build his own kingdom, his own reputation, his own name, and that he was building his ambition, his name, his reputation on the backs of his followers and they were, they were carnal minds, what they were. They couldn't even recognize a sincere person because, of course, none of these things were true. The health and the well-being of the church was always forefront in Paul's mind, and it provided the motivation for everything that he did, right? There are some people, listen to this, there are some people who will discredit you just to diminish your influence. When they see that people are attracted to you or drawn to you or respond to you in a positive way, there are some people who will purposely go about to diminish your influence by throwing shade on your name or shade on your ministry or saying that, oh, he's not all that. She's not all of that. That's what was happening with Paul. While you're running around here talking about how great an apostle he is and how gifted he is and how God uses him, there's always some little pocket of people that's over there trying to kill your influence, kill your reputation, kill your name, and thereby what they're trying to do is make your ministry or your popularity ineffective. Somebody doesn't like you right now because of what other people are saying about you. I guarantee you. There's somebody who doesn't like you right now, not because they've had an experience with you, not because they've had an encounter with you, but they've had an encounter with somebody who doesn't like you, and they don't like you right now based on what somebody else said about you. Anybody know what I'm saying? So so people have a tendency to plant evil thoughts, right? Even when they see things that are going well, that are going effectively, that are working, People have a tendency to plant evil thoughts. And so if, if, if you are a weaker minded person, there is always the temptation that you be easily influenced by these accusations. So Second Corinthians chapter 10 is really a defense of Paul's ministry. He's 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 coming back. He's clapping back. Right. Against these accusations. You're telling people that I'm not real, that I'm not really called, that I'm not really uh, sincere. And so he wasn't so much worried about his enemies. 
He was more worried about the people that he was assigned to. Because there's always an element of people who are easily influenced. Their minds are weaker. They have a tendency to eat everything that's being tossed at them. That if somebody says something to them, they, they just accept that as truth. And so by them accusing Paul and them accepting it, it made these weaker-minded individuals vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. So here's what Paul encourages his readers to do. He said, I want you to guard your mind and watch your, here it is, your thoughts. Because all the enemy's trying to do by planting these negative thoughts in your mind is mess with your thoughts, mess with your mind, mess with your spirit, what Paul calls imaginations. In other words, your thoughts are running wild. They're all over the place. You have wild thoughts that go here and there. If you wonder why your life seems to be going here and there, why peace eludes you, why joy escapes you, why your peace of mind has never seemed to get a grip on it, it's because your mind is everywhere. It's all over the place. And it's a trick of the enemy because he knows if I can get your mind all over the place, your mind goes, your life goes where your mind goes. So he likes to keep you confused, doubting, wondering. And so even when somebody is standing in front of you to preach the word of God to you, the enemy is steady telling you in your mind, don't listen to them. Don't pay attention to them. They're not real. Nobody's real. Nobody's of God. Nobody's being sincere. All these thoughts that are going in your mind are, are, is going over the place because you're having wild thoughts. Even while you're sitting in service right now listening to this message, your mind is going in five different directions. It's hard for you to receive the word of God because your mind is thinking about what's on the stove after church. Where are we going to eat dinner? My kid across town. What am I going to wear to work tomorrow? Your mind's on somebody you got to deal with tomorrow. Your mind is everywhere. What's, what are they doing on social media right now? What's happening? All these things are going on in your mind, see? Because your life here, listen to this, your life is a direct result of your thoughts. You understand what I'm saying? Where your mind goes, your life goes. Thoughts become actions. And actions become habits. Where we are, we are constantly what we do. It all starts with your head. So what Paul says is you have to bring your mind in. As your mind goes in five different directions, you have to have the kind of discipline that you bring your mind in. Your, your mind is wandering here and wandering there into all kinds of suspicions and thoughts and speculations and ideas as we're being fed from all different avenues, whether it be from television or from radio or from false teaching or from false preaching. And your mind can go in 15 different directions. And if you wonder why your life feels so helter skelter and here and there, it's because your mind is scattered everywhere. Your mind is in this and your mind is in that. And you have these bad mood swings because your mind goes from this extreme to that extreme to this situation to that situation. One minute I'm very angry. One minute I'm happy. You're almost schizophrenic because your mind is going everywhere. Your mind, your, your thoughts are wild. And wild thoughts left unchecked begin to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, against what you know about God. It's not that you don't know the word of God. It's just that the things that are being fed to you begin to exalt themselves against what you know about God. Here's what Romans says. Book of Romans. Follow me here. Here's why it's so important. Because the Bible says this in the book of Romans. You have to follow this. That when they knew God, this was the judgment he had, the issue he had with the Gentiles. That when they knew God, they didn't glorify God, neither were they thankful. That when they knew God, when they knew the truth, they didn't give him no glory. Neither were they thankful. That's, that's why we push so strongly for worship service. Because the worst thing you can do is to be in the presence of God and act like you don't know him. To be in a strong anointing like this where the worship of God is going forth and you sit there with your legs folded, your arms folded, half asleep, and be unthankful. This is what got on God's nerves about the Gentiles. He said, you know I'm God. I've proven myself to you. Even nature is showing you that I'm God. Even without a Bible, without anybody to teach you, you should be able to look up at the universe and say there must be a God somewhere. You, you should be able to look at your hands and the way your body is made and come to the conclusion there must be a God somewhere. Who could do this but a God who is a creator of everything? So, so, so even without anybody giving you a check or a car or a boo or a new house, you should be able to look around you and say, Lord, you are worthy. 
It's challenging to me when we have believers, folks that God has snatched out of the clubs and snatched out of sin and snatched out of drugs, that you could sit there with your saved self and not even acknowledge the presence of God. That in this church, we don't want to be a church that you got to pull and pump and prime to get a praise out of you. If you just look at what God has done for you already, if you don't do nothing else. If you don't, I mean, the car you drive, the health that you have, the intellect that you have, the job that you have. Is there anybody who's grateful that God has done anything for you? How dare you sit there as blessed as you are and not tell God thank you in this service? You wouldn't have the breath you have. You wouldn't have the health you have. You wouldn't have been brought up in the family you've been brought up in. You wouldn't have the job you have. Somebody that knows that God's been good to you, take 30 seconds and give him a praise right here. I will refuse to be unthankful. I refuse to sit here and not say, Lord, I praise you. Somebody give him 30 seconds right here. Because, but here was the problem, the book of Romans, because the people did not like to retain the knowledge of God in their minds because they did not like to put God in a place of prominence in their minds, keep him forefront in their minds. They changed the truth into a lie. And here it is, they chose to believe a lie. Yeah, they didn't like having God preeminent. They didn't like having him forefront in their mind. And so because they insisted on following a lie, here's the warning, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind basically means they had no rules, no principles. The worst thing that God can do to you is to turn you over to yourself. The Bible says in three times in the book of Romans chapter one that he turned them over. Because they were stubborn, because they insisted, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to forget about God. I'm going to forget he's Lord of my life. I'm going to live the life I want to live. It's my thing. Do what I want to do. You can't tell me who to sock it to. And because they insisted, I want to live this way, even when I know the truth, God said, okay, have it your way. The worst thing that God can do to you is to turn you over to yourself. He ain't got to send a plague He ain't got to send the devil. He ain't got to send the sickness. All he got to do is turn you over to yourself and let you go and do your own thing. And you will do any wild, wicked, vile thing that you can come up with. That if God were to step back from you, I know right now God, God, I know somebody said right there saying, well, I wouldn't do that. But if God were to step back from you, step back, step his presence back from you, pull off his restraints, that every person in here would do any wicked, wild, vile thing that your mind can come up. I know you don't believe it. I know you miss goody two shoes. I know you're a deacon in the church. But if God were to withdraw his presence from you, every one of us in here, if he turned us over to yourself, I am my own worst enemy. I'm not worried about Michael. I'm worried about me. Come on, say amen, somebody. So because they did not want to keep God forefront in their minds, because they wanted to bow to these false idols, God said, okay, we're going to keep arguing about this. I'm going to turn you over to yourself. Lord, I know sometimes we color outside the lines. I know sometimes we make do things, make mistakes. But the worst thing you can do, Lord, don't turn me over to myself. Don't, don't, don't let me, when you read the book of Romans, it talks about how the men started going with the men and the women started going with the women and they started doing every sick and vile thing they could come up with, whatever their imagination could come up with. That's how depraved man is at his core. That the only thing that keeps me in check is God. How many witnesses I got in here? The only thing that keeps me in check is God. If it wasn't for God in my life, See, y'all looking at me funny. Deacon Mark, they're looking funny. If it wasn't for God in my life, you wouldn't want to be around me. I'm not somebody you want to hang out with. I'm not somebody that you even want to eat a hamburger with. But God is saying, because they refuse to give me my respect and honor me and worship me as God, I turn them over to their own mind. What am I saying? I'm saying people tend to worship their own opinion, right or wrong. They worship the images they've created in their own heads. Have you ever seen it? Have you ever seen people that, that they may not have no ponderance of evidence, no proof to support it, nothing to, no facts to undergird it, but yet they decided by an act of their own will to believe a lie. 
Have you ever known people who know it's a bold-faced lie, but they want to believe it anyway? You've given them facts, information. You've given them stuff to disprove what they believe in, but they insist on keeping a lie. They ins- and what do you do with a person who insists on believing a lie? I just believe this. I don't care what you say. This is what it is, and that's what I think about it. You can't change me. It's my truth, and my truth becomes more important than God's truth. And the struggle we have with our flesh is you got one truth. You got one mind. You got one thing you want to do, but you put it up against what God says he wants from you. And in most people's minds, they would rather go with what they think rather than what God says. Oh, I'm stepping on toes today, ain't I? Listen, just because you think it doesn't make it true. (laughs) Just because it came to your mind does not mean it is true. It could be rooted in a lie. And so you have to take whatever you believe and it has to pass the truth test. The truth test is God's word. The truth test is not your friend. The truth test is not your homie. The truth test is not the people that you hang out with. Because some of the people that you hang out with may be bought into the same lie as you. So you can't assume that because all of us believe this, that it must be true. It may not be true. You have not researched it. You have not studied it. You have not checked it. Have you ever had somebody tell you something and you thought, oh, my God, and you just accepted it as factual and you ran with it? That's how rumors start. Somebody says something to you. You ran with it as if it was Bible. And now you are running with something that wasn't based in truth in the first place. You don't put it to the truth test. You don't go to find out no facts to figure out if it's true or not. And so for many of us, we have denominational beliefs. We have core beliefs. We have things we live by that are not even rooted in the word of God. Many things that we do, that we hold to, that we adhere to, that even if somebody is teaching you that it's wrong, you still insist on, but I'm going to believe this lie. I'm going to stay right here because this is what my mama said. This is what my grandmother said. This is what my friends say. Our church believes this. Our denomination teaches this. So it must be true because Bishop so-and-so said it was. You don't study for yourself. You don't check into it. You don't go back to see if there's actual proof in the Bible that supports that. You just accept it as true. And even when somebody tries to tell you that it's wrong, we still insist on having it. So the first major key for spiritual victory, beloved of God, is casting down these thoughts, these imaginations. And listen, we got to struggle with them. We got to wage war against them. These thoughts, these images, these things we set up in our mind, I say we have to wage war because they don't come down easy. How many know what I'm talking about? How many know that the things that you believe in don't come down easy? Especially if you've been steeped in it all your life. If you've been taught, that's why prejudice is so difficult to fight. Because if you've been taught something, believed something, steeped in something, fed something for 30, 40 years of your life, and then somebody comes along and teaches you that's wrong, it's going to be hard for you to give that up. It could be wrong as two left shoes. But because this is what I've been doing since I was 10 years old, it must be true. So the first thing I'm going to say to you is, number, write this down. You've got to identify your images. We tend to think of idols in terms of, listen, Statues, figurines, sacred pillars, poles, towers, rocks, trees. That's how we think of idols. So we think if we're not out there worshiping a rock, we must be good, right? So we don't think of idols, but we don't think we have idols, but we do. Here's, a, here's four questions I want you to answer. This will help you identify idols that may be in your life. You good? Where do you spend the majority of your time? Where do you spend the majority of your money? Where do you get the most joy? What's constantly on your mind? I'm not saying that you can't spend time doing other things, but when you look at your life, where do you spend the majority of your time? I mean, the, the, the vast majority. I can tell what you're into by looking at your checking account. You can tell me I'm into this, I'm into that, but if I pull your checking account, your money goes 
where your interest goes. So if you're into alcohol, I can see on your checking account where you bought all kind of alcohol and liquor. If you're into porn, if I check your checking account, I see you're into porn. Where do you spend the majority of your time? Because where you spend your time, your money, your energy is a clue as to what you value. And anytime those things become more valuable or you spend more time doing it than you spend with your God, I'm not saying it is, it could be an idol. Your social media could be an idol. Here you go. All day long. All day long. All the moment you get up, got your phone. All day long. You can't even sit in church without getting on your, on your social media. You just can't. It's like crack. I, I just can't get it. I can't, I can't, I can't. You sleep with it on your chest. Just wake up. Got to check my social media. I'm not saying you got an idol. I'm just trying to help you identify your idols. Anytime you spend more money at the mall than you pay in your tithes, it might be an idol. Oh, we might not shout today, Mark. We might not get no shite today, out today, Michael. Anytime I can see you spending all kind of money on shoes, I'm not saying don't buy shoes, but anytime you look at your bank account and you see more money you spend on shoes than you spend on your God, it might be an idol. Anytime I can see where you spend more money on entertainment than you do in service, entertainment might be your idol. I've seen people who will spend thousands of dollars to fly to some exotic place and spend an absorbent amount of money and feel no badness about it and will come to church and will cry over $10. Where do you get the most joy from? The Bible said that the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is the thing that gets me going. The joy of the Lord is the thing that makes me go. But when you look around and you'd rather do anything but God, I got to go down to the store. I got to get my music. I got to get my fix. I got I, I, I to gotta go do whatever it is that you do. Those things give you joy. And it makes no, and, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that you can see uh, Broadway in Nashville teeming with people shoulder to shoulder bumping into each other till 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning but won't come to church. It doesn't surprise me that all the sports areas are open, all the bars are open, all the restaurants are open. You can go to church after, you can go to the restaurant after church today and there'll be a line outside your favorite restaurant but you can come to church and there will be spaces between you that you could throw a chair. Doesn't surprise me. It might be an idol. It may be that we put entertainment, food, people, places, things in a place where God says, I want to be. It doesn't surprise me that you can sit up and watch a four hour Marvel movie and won't move and won't spend 60 minutes in church. This is too long. Church is too long. I don't know why we're here this long. But you will sit up and watch somebody play at a club for hours and hours and hours. It might be. <laughs> number two. You got to. That was number one. Identify your images. That's your business. Number two. Confront your images. You can't change what you won't confront. We bow at the altar of a lot of things, we just don't realize it. For example, we bow at the altar of people's opinions. We bow at the altar of people's opinions. People's opinions become your, your God. How do I know? Because people's opinions become more important to you than what God is saying. You know they, they could be telling you something that you know is against God's word and you know to be true, but you won't confront it. You won't say anything about it because you want to keep your friendships. So you bow at the altar of people's opinion. You're so worried about what people think that you don't worry about what God thinks. You're more worried about what your pastor thinks, what your girlfriend thinks, what your homies think, rather than what does God think about this? 
We bow at the altar of relationships where we spend more time with people and having their company become more important than spending time with God. We bow at the altar, this is for my single people, you bow at the altar of companionship where your desire for a spouse becomes like an obsession. You can't have a talk about nothing without you talking about having a spouse. I just want a spouse. I just want a spouse. I just want to get married. I just want a boo. I just want a bow ass. And so it becomes almost a distraction. You're not talking about God or preaching or favor or your calling. All you talk about is if I had a boo. If I, Lord, I woke up this morning believing God for a boo. God, can you send me a boo? I want somebody. I'll do anything. To get me a spouse. I'll go anywhere. I'll compromise myself because my desire to have a spouse has become my God, my obsession. It's all I think about. When I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking, I wish I had somebody laying here. (laughs) All day long, hope I meet somebody today. Come to church, I hope I meet somebody today. What's your name? Somebody can't say hi to you without you saying, are you my Boaz? I can't, I ain't, all I said was hi. All I said was you look nice. I know, are you my Boaz? Just distracted with it. All your social media posts are about finding a boo, finding a man, finding a woman. You don't post about life, about God, about purpose, about money, about anything. All you have at the top of your mind is getting you a spouse and God is jealous. Because you don't wake up in the morning seeking him like that. You don't walk around with him on your mind all day like that. You don't walk around talking about how good God is. And some of you have fooled around and got married and made your spouse a God. Now I got the pressure of trying to be God in your life. (laughs) When you were single, Tarita, not you, but I'm saying when you were single, you was in church serving and working. We could count on you. Got married. We ain't seen you in three weeks. I can always tell when you got a new boyfriend because we don't see you for three weeks. She must have a, she must got a new boo. All up on Facebook grinning and everything because you got a new boo. Then y'all break up. You back in church. I'm serving the Lord. I guess you are now. You done broke up. <laughs> You become obsessed with companionship, even making your spouse or sometimes making your kids your God. Did everything. And I'm not saying don't take care of your kids or your spouse, but here's what God said. Anything that you prioritize over me becomes your God. And I'm jealous. Oh, let me come on down the street so I done made you mad. Look, some of you, your job is your God. Your career your title, your position becomes more important to you than your God. You are obsessed with your job. In particular, men, because we tend to get our identity or gain our sense of identity from what we do. Right? We love position. We love title. We love walking in saying, I'm the vice president. I'm the manager. I'm the COO. We get off on that, right? And so when you mess up with our job, you mess with our whole identity. So for us, it's all about getting that paper, Carmen. It's the paper chase. And you are so obsessed with getting the paper. We're so, you're so on the paper chase that you forget about your God to the point that you're willing to compromise yourself. Compromise your walk with God. Compromise your morals. Compromise your standards just so you can make a dollar. Y'all getting tight up in here. You want to take anything just to get a dollar, even if it means you have to deny the fact that you are a Christian. That there are some things that you have to turn down because it goes against what I believe. There are some jobs I may have to say no to because it is against my belief. Oh, y'all don't want to accept that. Y'all don't want to hear that. But when money becomes your God, you'll do anything for money. You'll say anything. You'll go anywhere. And so you have to confront these things because all these things have to be confronted if you're going to see a move of God. Is it possible? I'm not saying it is. I'm just posing questions. Is it possible that your desire for money 
has been the thing that has kept you from moving into a real move of God. Is it possible? Is it possible that the reason you're not experiencing a greater move of God is because entertainment has become your God? See, over here, we stress worship because worship is intimate. Worship is personal. The Bible says that everything had breath, praise the Lord. Anybody can praise the Lord. But worship requires another level of intimacy. So we stress worship over here because the only way to, to worship God is to give him worth-ship. To give him value. Entertainment can be gotten anywhere. But worship is an experience. When we come over here, we try to get you into a worship experience. My brother God plays the sax a few minutes ago. That wasn't just entertainment. That wasn't just entertainment. That was worship. That wasn't just somebody tickling my ear and making me feel good. That was somebody ushering us into the presence of God because that's what God wants. Whether you're playing a drum, whether you're playing a keyboard, whether you're leading a song, whether you're playing an instrument, God wants you to bring into an intimate relationship with him. Anything you're doing that doesn't push you into a deeper relationship with God needs to be thrown down. Look at this, I want to go deeper. So here's what I want you to do. Third thing, you got to cast down these images. Paul said to cast down imaginations. That means cast down is a violent term. It means to depose, to destroy, to demolish. It's not pretty. It's not nice. So here's what happens. Because while I'm speaking to you sometime, while I'm speaking to you right now, God is putting his finger on certain things that become an idol in your life. While I'm talking, the Holy Spirit is talking to you. That I shot some things out there, but he's putting his finger on specific things. Thank you, Lord or specific people that you have made a God in your life. Where God will tell you to do something, but you won't do it until they say it's okay to do it. And God is pointing to specific things and showing you what to do. But here's where you have to, here's your part. You got to cast, cast it down. God said, I'm going to point it out, but you got to root it out. It's going to be a partnership. Sharita, God said, I'm going to put the flashlight on it, and then you got to do something about it. I'm not going to come in, kick down the door, and snatch your idols out of your life. I'm going to show you where the idol is, whether it's your kids, whether it's your money, whether it's your job, whether it's whatever it is that you're into. God said, I'm going to put my finger to it, and then you got to love me enough to cast it down. Destroy it demolish it. Think about a building that's being demoed where they put all the dynamite around it and they explode that thing and the whole thing collapses. God said, I want you to get mad about it. I want you to get violent about it. I want you to be so upset that this thing is standing between you and your God. Well, see, that's the problem right there, Brother Moore, because you don't care that it stands between you and your God. And here's what God says. Anything you put between me and you I'm going to cast it down. So you thought your job was your God, right? Okay, I'm going to shake up your job. I'm going to show you who's boss. I'm going to cause crazy things to happen on your job just to prove to you that your job is not God. Oh, you want to worship your spouse, right? I'm going to let them do some crazy stuff. I'm going to let them do some things to break your heart to prove to you. That's respect them, honor them, but you can't worship them because I'm your God. Some of you worship people. Will you just love me? Will you just be my friend? Will you just be my friend? And what God will do is have somebody that you've been worshiping turn completely on you just to prove to you that they're not your God. I am. I am your God. I'm so much your God, I'll turn people against you because you always depend on the same person. When you need a financial breakthrough, you go to the same person every time. And God said, I will shut up their bowels of compassion because I'm trying to teach you that it wasn't them anyway. It was me using them. I used them to bless you. I used them to open a door for you. I used them to give you an opportunity, but you can't worship them because it was me behind them. Give me glory. You got to get mad about it. You got to get upset about it. The one thing that's killing the church today is apathy. It's a spirit of apathy. Like we'll know something is wrong, 
We'll know something is out of place, Carmen, but we just don't care. We'll know things are not supposed to be that way, but Angela, we just don't care. We'll step right over it. We'll walk right past it. We'll make excuses for it. Oh, that's Jimmy. They always do like that. Oh, that's Mary. Oh, yeah, we, we, we can get high and still, and still be preaching. It don't matter. Man, we don't care. We don't hold any standards anymore. We don't care. Oh, yeah, you sleep with whoever you want to sleep with and still be, you know, woman of God. Praise the Lord. Doesn't matter. We've gotten so apathetic. It doesn't bother us that souls can come in and out of our service and not be convicted by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't bother us that we're not filling the place up with souls. Oh, Mary so-and-so didn't come to church today. That's all right. Don't matter. We don't care. It's apathetic. That there is something standing between you and the next move of God. And the only thing that's bothering you is you don't care enough to remove it. Do you care enough about your relationship with God that you're willing to cut certain people off? That there are certain places that you just won't go because I care about my relationship with God. That there are certain things that I will not do because I don't want it to affect my anointing. See, the way we live now is, you know, it's your thing. Do what you want to do. Whatever you feel like doing it. It's all about you. It's all about how you want to live. It's your truth. Whatever. It, that may be you. If it's cool with you, it's cool with me. So what we have in church are apathetic people who do not experience a move of God because we don't care enough to cry out to God. There should be something in the heart of the believer that says, God, I desire your presence. I desire God's presence in this church so much that I am on a hunt, Deacon Brown. I am on a hunt. Because anything that stands between us and a move of God has to be eliminated. You don't care enough about having God's presence that you're willing to eliminate. You're too loyal to people. You're too loyal to denomination. You're too loyal to the things that make you comfortable. And you'll never get a move of God as long as what you're loyal to is more important than your loyalty to God. Oh, I'm stepping on toes. Say amen or say ouch. Yeah, I heard all over my, my toes are, are squeaking too, my brother. Listen, th there are things that God is saying. If you got rid of that, you would experience a whole nother level of glory. You would experience a whole nother level of anointing. That there is a glory that you haven't even experienced yet. I've just been waiting for you to give up your idol. It amazes me, the number of people who have a substance that they can't give up, that you'll let a small thing mess up your walk with God. Something so small, something so insignificant, a small thing like that, you, you, you're going to let a cigarette stand between you and God. You're going to let a marijuana cigarette get between you and God. You, you're going to allow 30 minutes with this person to stand between you and your God. I mean what? The sex is that good. Oops. It was that good. 30 minutes it probably last. And you're going to let that stand between you and your God? Really? <laughs> Why y'all laughing? Y'all evaluate nature. You really, you really going to let that overtime stand between you and your God? You love the job that much. Overtime, under time, all the time. You love sports that much. That you'll let it stand between you and your God. Pastor, you sound kind of personal. It is personal. It's supposed to be personal. You ain't supposed to shout over this. Because the problem is that we're shouting over too much stuff that God wants to confront. You're dancing over top of stuff that God's saying, you're going to dance over top of that? No, we're not. We ain't going to dance over top of that attitude. You insist on hanging on to your unforgiveness until your unforgiveness has become your God. 
and your unforgiveness is standing between you and your God. You mean to tell me you're going to let your attitude about her stand between me and you? The Bible says if you have an art against your brother and you come to the altar, leave your gift there, go straighten it out with your brother and then come back and I'll receive you. Is it possible that I'm not receiving you because you won't forgive them? Oh, my God. Oh, but that's your idol. You're going to hang on to your attitude. I'm, I'm going to be mad. I'm going to be mad for 20 years. You're just going to be mad. You could have been down the road. You could have been blessed. You could have gone on with your ministry, but you decide I'm going to be mad at them. And even though God has told you to let it go, forgive them. It's not important. I used it to get you to a place. You still want to be angry. I'm not going to come back until they come back and apologize. What if they never apologize? You're going to let that thing stand between you and your God, you and the presence of God. And I see you shouting, but there's no anointing in it. And I hear you playing. And I hear you preaching, but there's no power in it. And I hear you singing, but there's no glory in it because God said, no, 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 no. We got to deal with this idol right here. We got to deal with this idol right here. You are bowing at the altar of fame and popularity and you're worried about what people think rather than what I'm saying. Somebody in here need to throw your idols down. You're being too nice with it. You're being too patty cake with it. Well, I'm going to go and lay this down. God said, no, throw that thing down. You got to get mad. You got to get violent. This is all this is coming down. Every lie, every untruth, every act of foolishness, it is coming down. Look at somebody say, bring it down. I don't know what your idol is. I don't know what's standing between you and your God. But God says you need to get mad and cast that thing down. Get mad and throw it down. Somebody do this. Let's throw it down. Throw your idol down. You can't patty cake this. You can't play with this. You can't coddle this. You can't put it in a corner and leave it there for a while and then come out and play with it later. You got to get mad and cast it down. It's messing with your mind. It's messing with your peace. It's messing with your joy. It's messing with your anointing. It's messing up your opportunity. If you get mad enough to break it down, God said the glory will come in. So I lift your hands and say, Lord, send the glory. Let me close with this. It was a very strange message, Sarita. You text me and ask me, what was the title of my message today? And I couldn't say anything. See, every Sunday they text me and ask me, Pastor, what's the message? Because they put it on social media, they put it out. And I didn't say anything. Because it was the weirdest thing. It was the weirdest thing. Uh, and I almost struggled with it, Daphne. Because I said, well, Lord, I, if I start talking to them, about their idols, people are gonna turn me off. They're gonna turn, they're gonna walk out. They ain't gonna wanna listen. God, they want feel good messages. The joy of the Lord. They want feel good. They wanna be rubbed down. And God said, Do you have enough nerve to preach what I tell you? To make your face like flint? I said, well, God, why are you talking to me about this? This doesn't make any sense. He said, because I'm about to send revival. Yeah. Who am I talking to in here? God said, the reason why I'm cleaning up your house is because I'm about to send revival. In the Old Testament, every time there was a great revival, it was preceded by them tearing down idols first. When they tore down Dagon, when they tore down idols, when they tore down altars, when they tore down high places, the glory of the Lord would come in and send great revival. If God is pointing out the idols in your life, it's because God's about to send great revival. I wish I had somebody who was excited about what God's about to do in your life give him a shout right here I said give him a shout right here Satan your kingdom is coming down your nonsense is coming down your foolishness is coming down my anger is coming down my jealousy is coming down my lust is coming down and here comes the glory of God lift your hands and say Lord send the glory Oh my God. Oh my God. Somebody lift your hand and begin to worship the Lord right here. Lord, send your glory. I said, send your glory. 
I'm bringing in my wild thoughts. I'm bringing in my wild ideas. I'm bringing in my crazy ideas. I'm breaking down suicidal thoughts. I'm breaking down depression. I'm bringing down fear because I'm getting ready for the move of God. Somebody getting ready, shout, I'm getting ready. We ain't gonna dance till you get rid of some idols. We ain't gonna shout till you get rid of some idols. We ain't gonna have a Holy Ghost party till you get rid of some, for some, to, some idols. God said we ain't shouting till you get rid of some stuff. But for everybody that's ready to get rid of some stuff, jump up on your feet and be able to give God glory. I'm getting rid of some stuff. You got to go, you got to go, you got to go. Anything that's not like God has got to go. Look at somebody say, it's got to go. You might have been my friend for a long time, but you got to go. You might have been around me for a long time, but you got to go. I might have had this happen since I was 10 years old, but it's got to go. My anger's got to go. My lust has got to go. My fear has got to go. My addiction's got to go. My habits got to go. Somebody shout, you got to go. Lift your hand, begin to worship right here. God is sending revival right now. There's a revival going to hit this church. There's a revival about to hit your family. There's a revival about to hit your marriage. There's a revival about to hit your family. If you get rid of some stuff, God said, I'll send my glory. Who am I talking to in here? Who am I talking to in here? Who? Cast it down. Cast it down, sis. Cast it down. Cast down that illicit sex. Cast down that boyfriend. Get out of that relationship. Leave that situation. Get away from those friends. Drop your attitude. Leave your prejudice behind. Get rid of it. Touch about three people and say, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. I don't know what your it is, but God said, get rid of it. I don't know what your it is. God said, get rid of it. And if you get rid of it, I'm about to send the glory to you right now. Somebody lift your hands and say, I receive the glory. I receive the glory. I receive the glory. Drop your attitude. Drop your issue. Stop being mad. Get over yourself and let God's glory come on you right now. Come on. The glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. If you drop your idols, we wouldn't have to pump you and prime you to get a praise out of you. The only reason we can't get you to praise the Lord is because you're still worshiping your idols. Get over yourself and lift your hands and give God glory right here. I dare you to give him glory right here. I dare you to forget about these people and give him glory right here. I dare you to forget about yourself and your name, your reputation, how funny you look, how funny people looking at you and give God glory. I am the Lord your God. I will have no other God before me. I am the I'll have no other God in front of me. I'll have no other God in front of me. I'll have no other God in front of me. Drop your attitude. Drop your issues. It's a God. You need to cast it down. Drop your anger. It's a God. You need to throw it down. Drop your unforgiveness. It's a God. You need to throw it down. Walk around this room and find three people and tell them I'm throwing down some stuff. I'm throwing down some stuff. I'm throwing down some stuff. If you wonder why I'm praising God like I do, it's because I'm throwing down some stuff. I'm getting rid of some stuff. I'm kicking some stuff out of my house. I'm taking some stuff out of my closet. I'm getting all in my closet and in my drawers. I'm finding stuff in my pocket. You got to go and 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 you got to go. Catherine, here's when I know, here's when I know that they've thrown down their idols for real. Because we won't have to pull you into a worship. We ain't got to pull you into a shout. I'm liberating myself from stuff. And when I start liberating myself from stuff, I'll find the freedom to give God praise. 
Sometimes my greatest enemy is me. My thoughts, my ideas, my attitudes, the stuff I don't want to give up. Lord, deliver me from me. How many folks, that's your prayer? Lord, deliver me from me. Not my boss, not my spouse, it's me. I'm the one that's giving you issues. I'm the one that's hard-headed. I'm the one that won't bow. I bow. Come on, lift your hands and say, Lord, it's me. It's me. It's me. It's me standing in the need of prayer. It's me. I'm ready to give up my attitudes. I'm ready to give up anything that's in front of me and you. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I surrender. Woo. I feel the glory of the Lord. I feel the glory of the Lord. I see idols falling all over the room. I see chains breaking off all over the room. Somebody's shaking some stuff off right now. Somebody's finally letting it go. And I see somebody struggling with it. Because you feel like if I let this go, that I'm going to be naked. But God wants you naked. You're right where I want you. You're right where I want you. Like they say in the old church, Brother Moore, it's tight, but it's right. It's tight, but it's right. I got to get rid of this. I got to get rid of this addiction. I got to come out of this. I'm ready for a move from God. How many people are ready for a move from God? Lift your hands and say, Lord, deliver me. Deliver me. Deliver me. Deliver me. Deliver me. I don't know who I'm talking to in here. But God said, I'm about to send revival to your house. And I need you come here today to hear this message so that you can identify some idols in your life. And if you, if you, if you are willing to let that go, I got a glory waiting on you. (laughs) I got an anointing waiting on you. You ain't seen an anointing yet. You ain't seen the power of God yet. You ain't seen what's going to hit this church yet. Daphne, they haven't seen what's about to hit this church yet. You ain't seen it yet. You ain't seen it yet. When you start seeing them idols come down, you're going to see your glory so strong that when we walk in the room, we're going to be worshiping. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We ain't going to have a chance to get to the word of God or the singing or nothing. Because my idols are coming down. Drop! Stand to your feet. I'm done. 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 I'm going to let you go out of here. But in the last few minutes I got, if there's somebody in here who just drop your idols right now and lift your hands, begin to worship the God of heaven, the glory of the Lord will come on you. Come on, Sarita. the last day I'm going to struggle with this. It's the last day I'm going to fight with this. It's the last day. This is the last day I'm going to have this thing stand up in my face as God. It's the last time. God's trying to bring some people out of some stuff. Lift your hands and say, Lord, bring me out of it. I'm ready to come out of this. 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 I'm tired of being depressed. I'm tired of being worried. I'm tired of being frustrated. I'm tired of church as usual. I'm tired of pretending. I'm tired of being fake. I'm tired of going from bar to bar, from liquor to liquor, from woman to woman, from man to man. I keep running into stuff and it still don't satisfy. Lord! Deacon Brown, somebody asked me not long ago, they said, Pastor, why do you do altar calls? They said, why do you lay hands on people? They said, why are you so confrontational? I told them because I believe in deliverance ministry. I believe in deliverance. I believe in confronting devils 
and setting people free and getting them loose and breaking them out. I don't patty cake it. I don't play with it. I don't close the book and say good night, have a good day. I'm not satisfied until I walk right up in your camp and breaking curses and breaking generational curses and laying hands on people until demons come out. I'm not satisfied until you get delivered. I don't play with you. I don't skirt with you. I don't patty cake it. I get right down in the crawl because I believe in the power of God to set you free. Anybody believe that? Give God glory right here. Give him glory right here. Give him glory right here. Now listen. I got, you got about 30 seconds. If you're in here right now and you're struggling with any kind of idol, if you're struggling with any kind of issue, I want to invite you to come to this altar right now. If you're not afraid and if you're not scared and if you're not worried about what people think and you're ready for God to take you to the next level, I don't care who you are, deacon, minister, elder, media person, upstairs, downstairs, wherever you are, I believe that God sent this message for a reason because he's ready to send revival in your life. How many people are ready to see the real move of God? How many people are tired of church as usual. If that's you, I want you to come right now. Come up here quickly. Hurry up. I don't care if you're a visitor. I don't care if this is your last time, first time. I just want God to do something in my life. If there's one, I want you to come right now. I want you to come right now. Come on, Sarita. Tell us all.